my guess is that probably most uh, pastors at some stage during their ministry um, uh, would have asked someone to come and share something, handed them their microphone, and then regretted it. <laughs> it's always a risk, you know. It's a risk when, for example, you ask someone to share a testimony, especially if you, you know, don't know them all that well, because you never know what they're going to say. And then, of course, sometimes you've even got to wrestle the mic back off them um, because they don't want to give it back. Now, we're going to see an example of this kind of thing happening with the Apostle Paul today. Now, if you recall from our study last week in chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas, you know, came up against some uh, opposition from a sorcerer called Elimus. Uh, but the encounter didn't go very well for Elimus because he ended up blind for a while when, God, um, when God's hand came against him. And the lesson there was that if someone opposes you when uh, you're doing the will of God, uh, they are in fact opposing God as well as you. And opposing God is never a smart thing to do. Amen? Amen. Now from Paphos, where Paul and Barnabas led the proconsul to the Lord, they then went on to Antioch. And there they eventually got into trouble on their first visit to the synagogue um, where they were invited to speak. Uh, let's read um, how that happened from Acts 13, verse 13. Paul and his companions left, left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia, landing at the, town, uh, the port town of Perga, where John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now, incidentally, this decision by John Mark to leave them and go back to Jerusalem is what actually uh, eventually led to the fallout between Barnabas and Paul. It was all about John Mark. Anyway, verse 14, but Paul and Barnabas traveled inland to Antioch and Poseidon, uh, Pisidia, I should say. On the Sabbath, they went to the synagogue for the services. After the usual readings from the book of Moses and the prophets, those in charge of the service sent them this message. Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, come and give it. And this is where the synagogue leaders went wrong. They handed the mic to someone they didn't know. And uh, Paul would no doubt have still been wearing, you know, his usual Pharisee attire. And so when they saw him, uh, they would have naturally extended an opportunity for him to bring a word of encouragement to the congregation uh, as they would to any other visiting Pharisee. Of course, they got more word than what they bargained for that morning. Paul used the opportunity really well to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ by using, you know, 450 years of Jewish history. We won't read Paul's message today, but you can read it yourselves, you know, from verses 16 right through to verse 41. You can do that in your own time. Anyway, when he finished, the people liked what they heard and invited them to come back uh, again the following Sabbath, as we see in verse 42. No doubt, by the following Sabbath, the word had got out that there were new speakers in town. And so, apparently, everybody showed up to hear what else they had to say. Now, this was a great opportunity for Barnabas and Paul, but it was also their first undoing. Uh, a big crowd was always likely to incite jealousy in the religious leaders um, who, of course, could not pull a crowd themselves. And so it was with these Jewish leaders who just couldn't hack the attention that these visitors were getting, especially when they started talking about the possibility of God reaching out to Gentiles with the same gospel. So let's pick up the story from verse 44. The following week, um, almost the entire city turned out to hear them preach the word of the Lord. But when some of the Jews saw the crowds, they were jealous. And so they slandered Paul and argued against whatever he said. Then Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and declared, It was necessary that we first preach the word of God to you Jews. But since you have rejected it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we will offer it to the Gentiles. 
For the Lord gave us this command when he said, I have made you a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the furthest corners of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were very glad and thanked the Lord for this uh, for his message, and all who were chosen for eternal life became believers. And so the Lord's message spread throughout that region. Then the Jews stirred up the influential religious women and the leaders of the city, and they incited a mob against Paul and Barnabas and ran them out of town. So they shook the dust from their feet as a sign of rejection and went uh, to the town of Iconium. And the believers were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. In verse 47, we see Paul identifying not only himself, but also each and every one of us to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Paul quotes Isaiah 49, verse 6, which prophesied about Jesus, the coming Messiah. And it says, you will do more than restore the people of Israel to me. So this was God speaking about Jesus. I will make you a light to the Gentiles and you will bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. And so Paul says the exact same thing in verse 47, except now it's not in a future tense of I will make you, now it's I have made you. Isaiah prophesied over seven years uh, earlier that Jesus was going to be a light for the Gentiles, that he would bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And so here's Paul now saying that this is what the Lord has commanded us to do. In other words, we are commanded to do what Jesus was called to do. As you may recall, I've often referred to what I consider, you know, one of the Bible's most challenging verses. And that is 1 John verse 2, 6. That whoever claims to live in him, in other words, whoever claims to be a Christian must walk as Jesus did. Now this verse makes it clear that if we are Christians, that we should be identifying with Jesus in the way we live and not just by name alone. In other words, it takes more to being a Christian than just saying that we are. Now of course, living the way Jesus did is not an event. It's not just something that happened at some stage in our lives. It is a life journey with a destination. And it's a destination that none of us have yet reached. Now if we consider 1 John verse 2, 6. That tells us that we must live the way Jesus did in his humanity. And then if we look at the key words that Paul quotes from Isaiah. Uh, that, it, that, that, that he is... Uh, and as alike commanded to bring salvation to the ends of the earth, and then also consider what Jesus commanded in Acts 1 verse 8, uh, which is for all spirit-filled Christians, when he said, but you will receive um, power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, which includes Australia. Now, if we link those three verses together, uh, then uh, we kind of should start squirming if we try and, and think that the command to evangelize is only for evangelists and not a general command for all disciples. Now, I know that I'm starting to, you know, sound like a scratched record, um, but folks, I'm convinced that God really does want to alter our lifestyles. I'm convinced that God wants to do more with each one of us when it comes to reaching people for him. And we owe it to him and to ourselves to identify what might be holding us back. The days are short and, and heaven is far from full and, and God really does want to enlist soldiers to take arms and to start moving into the front lines. The enemy has been fooling us into thinking that he's winning the war. And we look around what's going around the world at the moment and we think, oh my gosh, what is going on? The war is being lost. But it's not. You see, the devil has actually already lost the war. He's still fighting battles, of course. But he's lost it. 
And we know that he's lost it. Why? Because if you go to the, to the last book of your, of your Bibles and read it, it will tell you how it's all going to finish. And so, you know, we don't know all the details, but we, not, we know enough details to know that in the end, we win. Amen. 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 In the end, we go to a new place, which is completely awesome. People all over the world, you know, are starting to wake up. Realizing that they have been swallowing a lie for, for too long and they're kind of getting a bit sick of it. Even before this COVID thing started, people were realizing, they were beginning to realize that not everything that they read, not everything that they see on TV, not everything that, that, that they watch on Facebook is the truth. Not long ago, we had no other means of getting news and getting supposed truth than from the mainstream media. That's how we got it. We either bought a newspaper or we waited for the six o'clock news to see what was going on in the world. That's what we did. That's how we got informed about what was happening outside of our own backyard. But now we've got lay journalists popping up all over the place in, in all the various pla uh, <coughs> excuse me, internet platforms. And many of them are actually telling the truth and exposing the lies of the mainstream media. And what this has done is it's making people unsure of what the truth is. They'll listen to one voice saying one thing, they'll listen to another voice saying the opposite thing. And so confusion is starting to challenge people's perception of what is the truth. Things that they always thought was right. Things that, you know, I thought this because my dad thought this. You know, I voted this party because my dad and my granddad voted for this party. You know, all of those kind of concepts are being challenged because people don't know what to believe anymore. And they're starting to question what th this truth that they always thought was the truth. And you know what? This gives us, the church, a wonderful new opportunity to spread the gospel truth to those who are starting to really search for genuine truth. And soon people will wake up to the biggest lie of, the, uh, of our world's history, which has been imposed on us through this COVID pandemic. And if you don't believe that we have been lied to, then you haven't been watching all the news. You've just been watching some of it. Of course, some people are committed to what they have chosen to believe. And, and nothing that you can do or say is ever going to change their mind because they are unwilling to change their minds. And they remind me of what the ostrich is famous for. When the world realizes that it has been duped good and proper, many, will, many are going to be severely shaken. And they're going to start to hunger for real truth. And you know what? When that time comes, and I believe it's here in our doorstep, uh, they will respond to the truth when we tell them the truth. Folks, this subject is coming up over and over again because God is wanting to turn this church into a beacon of light in our community. It needs it. Darkness is swallowing a lot of people up. And so I believe this is a God desire. It's not driven by me or by our other church leaders. It's, it's God's heart for our community and for the very streets that we live in. You've got to remember that whenever I refer to our community, I'm not just talking about the people around our church, but the people around our homes. That's our community. God wants us to reach people by showing them the way, by being the light that illuminates their pathway to God. When Paul said in Acts 13, 47, that God is, gives us this command, I have made you a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the furthest corners of the earth. Paul is confirming that the mission Jesus was called to over 700 years before his birth is the same mission that we are commanded to continue today. You know, we often use the term, you know, being called by God. When we are referring to something that we feel God has asked us to do. 
But I think that we sometimes overuse that term, you know, call to. I think the more accurate term is the one that Paul uses here when he says commanded to. We're not called to anything. We're either commanded or we're not. I suppose it's easier to say no to a call of God than it is to say no to a command. Maybe that's why we use that term. Now, I'm going to get a little personal just for a moment, and I'm going to ask you, how many of us have a problem with not answering questions truthfully? You can ask me by just showing me your hands. We got two honest people in the house. Three. Whoa. Now, I thought I would ask that because my next question is, uh, how many of us have a problem with selfishness? Oh, a few more hands up in the air. You know, the truth, folks, is that selfishness, to some degree or other, is an issue with most people. And selfishness happens to be the primary thing that keeps us from reaching out to other people. Now, whether it's to evangelize or to lend a helping hand or to be generous in times of need, selfishness is always asking, what's in it for me? How's it going to affect me? And so if the answer is nothing or not enough, or maybe it's the possibility of embarrassment, or maybe, maybe what's in it for me could be some criticism, then we will, like a turtle, pull our heads in and pretend that we can't be reached, can't be seen. The painfully discomforting truth is that selfishness is one of the major factors uh, in our common disobedience to God. And in our inability to fulfill the verse from 1 John 2, 6. You see, we don't want to follow Jesus we don't want to follow in his footsteps, not because we can't, but generally because we don't want to pay the price that our selfishness will have to suffer if we were to walk as Jesus did. And that's the main reason. It's not easy to walk as Jesus did because Jesus was not selfish. And most of us are to some degree or other. Now some of you are thinking, this is not what I come to church for. I needed a warm fuzzy this morning. Not another in my face self-evaluation exercise. That's not what I come to church for. I know none of you feel like that, but trust me, some people do. I don't like it either. And remember, I get it before you do. A lot of the stuff that the Lord has me preach to you, I can assure you I am not exempt. But you know what? God loves us too much to not get in our faces about the issues that He sees in us that are holding us back from living the kind of abundant life that he wants to see us live. How many of us know that God always has our interests at heart and he is devoted, <coughs> excuse me, he's devoted to making our lives more abundant. The problem is that we don't always understand what a truly abundant life really is. We instinctively think of <coughs> material possessions or material security as a measure of abundance. But as we know, there are countless people who have more of that than they will ever possibly know what to do with, and yet they're still miserable and empty. The fact is that <clears throat> most people are searching for a better life for themselves. Christians are no different. We too are searching for a better life for ourselves. We know and we're thankful that when we leave this earth that we have a great life ahead. But we also want what's best now. Just like the rest of the world. But how do we live that best life? 
What is the secret to living a blessed life for the Christian? <clears throat> a few weeks ago, I challenged you with the thought that if we want to live a successful Christian life, we must know our purpose in God and then step out to accomplish that purpose. That if we're, if we're misplaced, if we're just out of whack in some way, if we're not in line with the will of God for us, then we're always going to be trying to find satisfaction somewhere else. And, and sometimes our search for that satisfaction leads us down the wrong path. I mentioned that regardless of what individual purpose we might each have, that we all have a common purpose. And that is to share the good news about Jesus with others. Well, we haven't really moved on from that, but the, the challenge for all of us today is how do we bring ourselves to take the medicine that we know is good for us? How can we motivate ourselves to do what we don't want to do? Even though we might know that it will be like good medicine for our soul. Well, I think the thought for today is to recognize that we all suffer to some extent from, uh, from self-itis. And what is self-itis, you might ask? Well, it's self on the throne. It's self on the top of the list. It's self above others, and so on the list goes. That's what self-itis is. Most people have some degree of problem with self-itis, but not all, of course. <clears throat> However, those who don't have a problem with self-itis, they stand out pretty clearly to us. How many of us reckon it would be pretty hard to start a rumor about how selfish the late Mother Teresa was? Of course, it would be because her life proved that she was not a selfish woman. She got more pleasure serving and living for others than she did living for herself. What about Jesus, in whose steps we ought to be following? What was the most obvious attribute of Jesus apart from his miraculous power? He was more consumed with living for others than he was for himself, even to the point of his willingness to suffer death, his own death, for us. Of all the miracles that Jesus performed, of all of the things that he did and said, his selfless life spoke the loudest and it touched the most lives and continues to touch them even today. There is a quality and a, and a power in selflessness that nothing can compete with. There is a power in living for others that touches and transforms the lives of people like nothing else would. Now, do any of you remember the classic movie Bridge Over the River Kwai? Just a few? I watched it several times when I was a young boy on TV. <clears throat> and I want to read you a true story that's found in the book Through the Valley of the Kwai by Ernest Gordon. Uh, it's a book about life in a Japanese prison camp. And the story is about a man who, through his selfless life, literally transformed a whole camp of soldiers. The man's name was Angus McGilvery. Angus was a Scottish prisoner in one of the camps filled with Americans, Australians, and Britons who had helped build the infamous bridge over the River Kwai. The camp had grown into a really ugly place. A dog-eat-dog -dog mentality had set in amongst the prisoners. Allies would literally steal from each other and cheat each other. Men would have to sleep on their uh, packs and yet still find that they were stolen from under their heads. Survival was everything. The law of the jungle was prevailing until news of Angus McIlvery's death spread throughout the camp. Rumors spread in the wake of his death. No one could believe Big Angus had succumbed to death. He was strong and one of those that they expected would have been the last one to die. Actually, it wasn't the fact of his death that shocked the men, but the reason that he died. Finally, the prisoners pieced together the true story. The Argyles, um, what they called the Scottish soldiers, took their buddy system very seriously. Their buddy <coughs> was called their maka. And I first heard that term when Dennis called me his mucker. And I thought he was being rude, but it turns out 
that having a mucker is a good thing. And these Argyles believed that it was literally up to each of them to make sure that their mucker survived. Angus, his mucker, though, was dying. And everyone had given up on him. Everyone, of course, except Angus. He had made up his mind that his friend would not die. Someone had stolen his mucker's blanket. And so Angus gave him his own, telling his mucker that he'd just come across an extra one. Likewise, every mealtime, Angus would get his rations, and then he'd take them to his friend, and he'd stand over him and force him to eat them. Again, stating that he was able to get extra food. Angus was going to do everything and anything to see that his buddy got what he needed to recover. But as Angus muckers uh, finally began to recover, one day Angus just collapsed, slumped over, and he died. The doctors discovered that he had died of starvation, complicated by exhaustion. Because for so long he had been giving his own food and shelter to his mucker. He had given absolutely everything he had, even his very life. The ramifications of his acts of love and unselfishness had a startling impact on the whole compound. As word circulated about the reasons for Angus's McKilvery's death, the feel of the camp began to change. Many of the other inmates realized that Angus had been living out what Jesus said in John 15, verse 13, that there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Suddenly, attitudes started changing, and the men began to start focusing on their mates, their allies, and on a humanity of living beyond survival. They began to pool their talents. One was a violin maker, another was an orchestra leader, another was a cabinet maker, another a professor. Soon the camp had an orchestra full of homemade instruments. And a church was started called Church Without Walls. And it was so powerful and so compelling that even some of the Japanese guards started attending. <coughs> the men began a kind of university, a hospital and a library system just to improve their lives. The place was transformed and the nearly smothered love of mankind had been revived. All because one man named Angus had given all he had for his friend. You know, for many of those men, this turnaround meant survival. This pooling together and caring for others rather than just for self was what ended up extending the life of everyone. What happened is an awesome illustration of the potential <clears throat> unleashed when even only just one person gave it all away by choosing someone else over themselves. And that's why Jesus did <clears throat> what he did in his giving up of his life. That's why what he did is had more power for transforming lives uh, than all of the miracles and the healings that he did. Because nothing compares with the power of a selfless life. That man Argus tapped into something that we can only understand when we tap into it ourselves. So what's the key? <clears throat> How can we be willing to die to ourselves so that we can truly be able to <clears throat> live our life more abundantly. I've only, I've only got one answer, one illustration perhaps. It's, it's like ice cream. When you feel ice cream, it isn't very appealing to touch. You know, in fact, it's, it's rather cold. Uh, you don't hang on to a tub of ice cream for long. You know, you take it out of the freezer and by the time you get to the kitchen or wherever you're going, you're ready to let go. No one wants to embrace a tub of ice cream, do they? And when you look at it, it's nothing much to look at. Someone told you that ice cream is really nice. You've never had it before. You've never tasted it. And so you have a crack at it. You open the thing, you stick your spoon in it, and you're still not very impressed because all you've done is you've bent your spoon. But finally you taste it. And then you know it's true. You know it really is good. 
You see, the blessings are, of obedience are kind of like ice cream. Until we taste them, we don't know how good it is. The blessings of living for others can only be tasted by living it out. But once we've tasted it, we're going to keep wanting to go back for more. The challenge for us as a church is how to transcend from living as most Western Christians do to living as the Bible commands us to live. The problem is that we can be so stereotyped that we can't even see how to change. We look at everyone else and everyone else is doing the same thing. And so we start convincing ourselves, well, this is normal, this is okay. But is it truly biblical? Are we all called to testify about the relevance and goodness of Jesus Christ in our life? I think we are. I think the Bible makes it clear that we are. Are we to be lighthouses or beacons of light in this dark place and show people the way to God? Yes, we are. So why don't we? Why do most of us have trouble doing this? Are we rebellious? No. I don't think that's the reason. I think we've stereotyped, stereotyped evangelism and placed the responsibility for it on the evangelists. And we can't see how we can do it ourselves. You see, the truth is that some of us find confronting people with the message of the gospel quite easy. I'm sure that most of us will know someone that finds it very easy to just go and talk to strangers about Jesus. But what about those of us that find it really hard? What about those that just don't seem to have the personality to be like that? What are they to do? Do they not also have the call or should I say, do they not have they not also been commanded to be a light and to take the gospel to the ends of the earth? Well, yes, they have. So how can we get around this problem and not condemn one another because of our different gifting or different personality traits? Well, I think it has to start with a reset on how we see evangelism. A reset on how we see ourselves as being a light in people's lives. As God's people, we have so much to offer others. Yes, the ultimate goal, of course, is to have them receive the offer of salvation. But until we get them to that point, we have much to offer in the way of companionship and friendship and advice and godly examples of kindness and forgiveness and self-control and all of the other fruit of the Holy Spirit. Things that they look at us and wonder, what is it about that person that makes them the way they are? I've confessed to you before, when I met this girl in the front row here, I was consumed by her beauty. She was hot. <laughs> and I wanted her badly. And I was willing to do anything to get my claws into her. But you know, somewhere along the line, I started looking at her and I started seeing more than her physical attributes. I started seeing something in her and I started becoming attracted to that. But that wouldn't have happened if I didn't have some contact with her. You know, if I had just walked past her on the street and, and did, you know, one of those, that wouldn't have been enough. But she gave me an opportunity to see Jesus in her by... Of course, she had a mission I didn't know. You know, I was her target. She wanted to get me saved. I thought she just liked me. But the point is that she gave me an opportunity to see Jesus in her. And after a while, I was no longer so interested in her physical attributes. I was starting to get interested in what she was who she was, what made her tick, what made her the way that she was. I didn't know it was Jesus in her, but guess what? I eventually found out it was him. Amen? 
And so you may not feel equipped to be an effective evangelist as we think evangelists. So you've got to get Reinhard Bonnke and Billy Graham out of your head. Because not every evangelist is like them. They were special. They were commanded to be like that. You see, the fact that we don't feel as equipped as them should not stop you from building relationships with people and then using the love of God in you to woo them to Jesus. If the Holy Spirit puts something on your mind that involves reaching out to someone in your neighborhood or someone in your workplace or, you, or even someone that you shop regularly from, then don't assume that God is going to need you to preach the A to Z of the gospel to them. Don't fear that you will need to know all the doctrines of our faith. We were never taught or told or called or commanded to do that. We were never commanded to be theologians and share our knowledge with others. We we're just commanded to share our story about what Jesus has done in our lives so that people can gain hope and faith to believe that maybe he can do it in their lives. That's evangelism. We can all do that. You all have a story about what Jesus did in your life. Don't you? Yes. Amen. I'd like to ask Bernie to come and just share a short story that illustrates how God used her to reach someone in a very easy but yet very significant way. A way that had that person experience the love of God. It was Evangelism 101. It was evangelism sowing seeds. It was evangelism making a difference. It was evangelism by letting someone feel the love of God. Come on, Bernie, come and share that story quickly. Come here. It's actually a very small thing, very um, every day that any of us could do. And um, it was many years ago and I had little children and there was a lady in our circle and it was her birthday. And uh, because I, way back then, had a big performance anxiety thing that everything I did had to be perfect. Funny that. And, um, but anyway, I thought, okay, I'll bite the bullet. And um, I think I had three little children, little baby. And in, it was her birthday, and I, so I invited her and a few of, of our friends, maybe only about four of them, to my home and um, made a cake and... Just, you know, a little bit for morning tea. Nothing huge, nothing, you know. And this was um, a beautiful South African lady. Anyway, she came and towards the end of the morning, I noticed that she was, she was just really overwhelmed and she got very emotional. And I thought, well, gee, you know, it was, it was really no big deal um, because it was just like morning tea and that's something we did back there. We often had, you know, would have people over for morning tea anyway. I mean, going to Mary, and, and it really did shock me. She was um, she's in her early thirties, and she said, she said, I have never had a birthday cake. No one had ever <laughs> made a birthday cake, a cake with candles, or celebrated her birthday. And I was really shocked, but she was really undone about it. Um, and and I guess at the end of the day, uh, only God knew her need. Only he would. Only he knew what she needed and I had absolutely no idea which is probably a good thing but I was blown away and because of that um, you know I just want to encourage you if God puts it on your heart to do something even if it doesn't seem significant as that really didn't um, you can trust God because you know it's that it's it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance and it's the kindness of God when he does something like that he touches right into us 
a place that we know only he knows. She knew I'd have no idea, and that was probably more significant to her. And I think, um, yeah, we can get all tied up in, in as Pastor Drew said, doing, doing the huge things, but at the end of the day, um, when we moved in kindness, when we moved by his love to do those random acts, it's as if God is doing it because it touches the heart in a way that we couldn't possibly do. So um, I've learned not to be too um, censor too much when I feel to go do something. And I just want to encourage you to do that too. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Bernie. <laughs> and you know, so often it's just those simple things that we do that can make such a difference in people's lives. And, you know, I think that we really need to just reset our idea of what evangelism is. You know, we, I, I'm convinced that most people, most Christians have this wrong concept of what it is. And, and, and we need to start seeing it as, as, um, as, as, as a farmer does. What does a farmer do? When he's planting his crops, first he, he, he softens the soil up. Now we do that through communication. We do that through friendship. We do that through connecting with people. Might be a neighbor, might be someone that we work with, might be a shopkeeper that we regularly shop from. And so we build a relationship. Could be your hairdresser or, or, or you know, your nails person or whatever. And, and so you build relationship with people. And so as you're doing that, um, and, and, and you let them know who you are. You let them know that you go to church. You let them know that you love God. And, and so what you're doing is you're breaking up the ground. You're preparing them for the seed. And guess what? You may not even be the person who sows that seed. It could be someone else that comes into their life. But you've done the preparing. You've, you've done the, 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 the breaking up the hard ground. And so then someone else comes and sows the seed. And, 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 and that seed now has some soft ground to fall into, not this hard, rocky thing that, the, that the, uh, the, the wind just blows away. But no, you've prepared the soil and so the seed actually gets in there. And then guess what? It starts growing and then someone else comes and waters it and someone else comes and fertilizes it. And, and before you know it, a crop comes out. Does it matter who's there at the harvest time? No. What matters is that there is a harvest. It doesn't matter who did what. And so we've got we to gotta think of evangelism as steps. Forget this instant coffee thing that if I go and talk to that person, he's got to become a Christian. And if that doesn't happen, then I have failed. And because I've done that so many times, I'm not an evangelist, so I'm never going to do it again. That is faulty thinking. Because let me tell you, those who went to Reinhard Bonnke's Massive crusades, those who went to Billy Graham's massive crusades were taken there by someone who had already planted some seeds. They were taken there by someone who had already been preparing the soil. They didn't just walk up off the street. Oh, what's going on over there? Let's go and have a look. No. Reinhard Bonnke and, 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 and um, Billy Graham and all of those other great voices of evangelists were successful because the little people like us prepared the ground, sowed the seeds, and then took them along. And so we are all important. We're all evangelists. We've got to get Billy Graham out of our head. Because probably none of us here can ever be like that. But Billy Graham couldn't be who he became without us taking people to his crusades. Does that make sense to anyone here? And so we've got to think differently. We've got to start hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit when He tells us, invite that person. Now, there's some people find it very easy. Liz and Steve, they're social butterflies. They love it. It's not a chore or a duty for them. That's who they are. Go and hang out with them. Find out how they do it. They'll tell you all the wonderful stories about how they've been able to touch people's lives just the way Bernie shared her story. But all of us can do that. Amen? It's not hard. You don't even need to know your doctrines. 
You just need to have the Spirit of Jesus in you. Folks, the Lord will never tell us to do things just for the sake of it. He always has a purpose. And that's why it's so crucial that, when, that, that we do what we're told. Even if it doesn't make sense to us at, at the time or, or we don't think that it's going to be very meaningful. God knows the hearts of people and he knows what will touch them best. I've told you the story before of how, you know, this 15-year-old boy that apparently I had such an impact in his life, I can't remember any of it. But his mom told me that, that she was so grateful for my input into her son's life. And I'm like, what did I do? To me, it was very insignificant, whatever it was, but to him, it was a big deal. And that's how it is so often. And so we need to get rid of our stereotyped ideas of evangelism and just be open to what the Holy Spirit might tell us to do because he knows what is best for that person. Just like when he put it on Brittany's heart to bake this lady a cake. And so remember, if you ever get a thought or an impression about doing something for someone that you don't really want to do, it's most likely the Holy Spirit's voice talking to you. No other voice is going to ask you to do that sort of thing. You realize that, don't you? And so just do it in faith. If we as a church made a decision to become intentional about just blessing some non-Christian that we have in our life, if, we, uh, if we're intentional about blessing that person on a regular basis, maybe once a week or once a month or whatever, eventually this church would be turned upside down. Because you know what? We can only sow for so long. We can only water for so long. We can only plow for so long. Eventually, a harvest has to come. Farmers don't do what they do for nothing. They do it because they know they're going to have a result. Yes, we are commanded to be a beacon of light in our community. And that means around our church, it means around our homes, it means in our work and study places. We're not called to that, we're commanded to be a light. We're commanded to illuminate the way for people's pathway to God. But here's the thing, folks, there's, there's many ways of shining our light. Amen? Amen? Amen. Can I have the worship team up and we're just going to... I'll close the service with a song and I just want to pray for you as we do. And then um, if you need any prayer at all, please come as we sing the song and I'll gladly pray for you. Father God, we just thank you so much that someone had the courage to reach out to us at some stage. And Lord, that resulted in us finding salvation, finding you, having our lives completely changed. And Lord, we are grateful for that. Lord, help us to never forget that it was someone reaching out to us that made the difference. And so, Lord, when we hear your small, still voice telling us to reach out to someone, Lord, help us to remember someone reached out to us. And that made all the difference. And so, Lord, give us the courage to be obedient to that voice to your small, still voice, Lord, I know you don't shout. I wish that you would shout at us. But Lord, it's for us to learn how to communicate with you, not for you to have to shout at us. And so, Lord, help us to be sensitive to your voice, Lord God, so that we can start making a difference in people's lives. And we thank you, Lord God, for your word. We thank you, Lord God, for your encouragement. And Lord, we just ask in Jesus' name that you'd help apply. Help us apply what we hear from your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen.